Good evening to the August meeting of the Hamlet City Council. We uh, met earlier at 4.30 to go over some issues dealing with uh, leave time for personnel and we went into uh, recess at approximately 5.30 and at this time we are reconvening for the meeting. We, at this time we would ask uh, Councilman Clewis if he would to give the invocation. Let us pray. Most gracious and kind, loving Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings on us. We thank you for taking care of the citizens of Hamlet and watching over and providing our needs. And Lord, we would ask that you would guide and direct us, help us to make wise decisions as we'll give you the praise, honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 At this time, we have before you the agenda for tonight's <clears throat> meeting. I would ask at this time for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. A second. And second. I got a second. Are there any changes or deletions that need to be added to it? It's just a small typo. Uh, but we just need to correct line seven for uh, forestry uh, rather than wildlife. NC Forest Resources rather than NC Wildlife. And are we are we going to strike eight? Item, uh, nine. Nine. Item number nine is to be stricken. The personnel leave time was settled at 4.30. Thank you. Are there any other changes at this time? Councilman Pressler is excused tonight. I make a motion we accept the agenda with the changes that have been made. Have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we also have before you the uh, regular minutes from the July 14th meeting. And you've also had presented to you the minutes from the closed session. What are your wishes at this time? So move to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any further comment on it? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, at this time, we reach a portion of our meeting where we have allow comments from the attendees. If you have some comments or ideas that you'd like to bring up before council, that are not on the agenda for tonight, we certainly want to hear it. And I'd also at this time like to recognize that we have scouts tonight from Troop 527 who are here because they're working on their citizenship merit badges and we're certainly glad to have you all with us tonight. So if there's anyone that has anything to bring before council tonight, please come forward to the podium and we will. If not, we'll close the comments from attendees. At this time, we, on item number six, uh, Mrs. Kelly Pruitt with Richmond County Tourism Development Authority is in attendance to offer a brief informational presentation. We would recognize you at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council, for giving me the opportunity to just introduce myself to the community here in Hamlet and um, uh, let everybody know what um, the new Richmond County Tourism is back up and running and what we're trying to do for all of Richmond County. Um, the first thing when I came in that I did was uh, reestablish in the visitor center, uh, which is on the corner of 74 and 1 in the old depot in uh, Rockingham. So it is now up and running uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and it has um, brochures from the area as well as from throughout North Carolina and um, very, all the various counties. So we're continually collecting that. As well as in the um, visitor center will be a museum, which I've been tasked with putting together, which will represent all of Richmond County. Um, and it will be inclusive of everything from our sports uh, history to um, anybody that came from here in the congressional and as well as representing all the high schools, uh, including the Hamlet High School. Um, anything that uh, represents the textile mills from, or the cotton, the mills, uh, the old mills, as well as our history of the racing, even though we don't have a lot of it now. But um, it will just be all inclusive. So we're asking uh, residents throughout the county to dig through their attics if they have any kind of memorabilia, old yearbooks, anything at all that they would like to uh, have preserved at the museum. Um, we would like you to get in contact with me. Um, we have museum cases being built at this time. Um, another thing that I was tasked with doing was developing a wayfaring system throughout Rockingham to kind of represent what um, Hamlet already has. So that is already in the works too, which will uh, help pinpoint everything from Cole Auditorium to any attractions that were within two miles out. 
Um, then uh, the next thing that I was tasked with was to rebuild the website that we had for Richmond County Tourism, which was uh, quite lengthy and, and not real user friendly. So that is now up and running and um, we're making additions throughout of a lot of things. Again, uh, it was kind of a one-man show, so I'm uh, still getting a lot of input from the community on um, attractions and different things like that that you know are just being added daily. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of asking Hamlet and Ellerby and Derby, each of the small communities, is to please, if you have uh, your business owners, um, your restaurants, your shopping, anything like that that would like to be added to the website, we are linking to each of the businesses. That's just a free service that we're going to do. The same thing for beds and breakfast, uh, any kind of attraction that even if it's a uh, something small that you feel is community, we, we're um, linking to that. So if you could uh, just pass the word to um, send that information to us as well. Um, one of the uh, other tasks is to um, develop more um, community events and things like that. So I, I did meet with your city manager uh, just recently to see what I can do to help up the tourism in Hamlet itself and, and did approach him with an idea that I had a gentleman that would like to do a big um, car show and as well as potentially maybe some Friday drive-ins and he is ready to go and um, so I did approach him to see if that would be something that Hamlet would be interested in. I did speak with him and he is very excited and, and would love to see that happen. Um, it will be, uh, I think, something that will at least maybe, you know, every Friday or every Thursday, whatever the comes into, the, to get some people to come in in downtown area. Um, I did meet with um, uh, several of your uh, members as well about working with the Hamlet Depot and, and borrowing some of those things that they've had to store um, from the depot to put in our museum and just kind of trading out and as well as offering for Hamlet will have its own uh, museum display case, you know, to just um, kind of showcase anything that you feel within the government or within the, some of the churches, anything that they feel that, you know, represents them and they would like to see some memorabilia out. So um, that is where we are at this moment. The final thing that I've put together and um, we are just waiting on the final say so to order is um, I worked out with Meridian um, kiosk system, which is uh, out of Aberdeen. And uh, we will be the first county in North Carolina to uh, utilize this program. And what it will do is we are going to place 18 kiosks throughout all the county attractions. That will be phase one. Phase two will ultimately include um, any attractions that we have. Um, you will have one here, an outside um, kiosk system between the, the depot and Amtrak in that center plaza. And what these offer is they tie into our website and uh, they will be anybody at any time will be able to push in and all the destinations, the attractions will be there. They can actually um, make reservations to hotels. They can go directly to the shopping. They can plug in whatever they want to do and they can say, I want to map out. I want to see every uh, museum that's in the area and uh, they will be able to download that to their phone. It's very, very user friendly. And so that ties back into, again, the more information I can get about shops, dining, any of that um, comes back. We have a, a, a software program that they are designing specifically for us. So um, it, is, it will be linked to the city's websites, anything as well as our, our um, website for the county. So that's pretty exciting. We're going to be a pilot project. Um, and so we're we're pretty excited about that and again you know it's we're going to be the first county of uh in all of north carolina to try this and uh, so we're really excited about that but i just thank you for the opportunity and, and i just encourage the any of the residents to please stop by the visitor center i'm kind of a one-man show i do have a little part-time help in the afternoon finally so i'm able to get out a little bit more and actually finally meet some of those final attractions that I haven't uh, been able to. And um, I'm just, any, anything that anybody needs done, please uh, do not hesitate to come in. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Anyone got any questions for Ms. Pruitt? Any questions? Thank you so much for being here tonight. I appreciate that update. Keep us informed. At uh, this time, we'll move along to item number seven, and we have a presentation by uh, NC Forest Resources, uh, Ranger Matt Gordon. He has been working with the city to on a uh, tree management plan for the city, and uh, we certainly appreciate what y'all are doing for us, and uh, we'll let you and uh, city manager give us an update. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Mr. Bayless, I just wanted to um, just state that Mr. Gordon is here with the Forestry Service tonight. If you have any questions, um, the Forestry Service has completed a land management plan for us for the property that we own uh, where the city lake, uh, the city's watershed sits on. And this is the property that we draw our water source from, uh, as well as the property that the city owns and uses to land apply the sludge from the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and uh, the, the trees and the foliage on both of these properties are mature. mature. And um, what the Forestry Service recommends that we do is uh, for certain zones, we uh, have some of these trees thinned uh, and cut um, uh, A, to reduce the risk of forest fire on the property. Richmond County has one of the, if not the highest rate of, uh, for forest fires in the state. Um, and also, uh, we, we use the property as a water source, but also we use the other property to apply the sludge from the wastewater treatment plant, and the state requires that uh, we apply it um, uh, in, in, in certain areas that are not too concentrated. And we, um, we, we use essentially uh, rows or roads uh, that we apply them on and uh, the roads need to be maintained so that uh, the trucks can get in and out of there real good and um, it's our understanding that this uh, could be a, um, uh, a source of revenue for, for the city as well. As long as you have um, consensus um, it's, um, we will go ahead and hire a consultant who will act in the best interest of the city in hiring vendors and tree management companies to thin the property and cut the trees down. Um, we certainly don't want to clear it, cut it uh, everywhere, make it, you know, just, we don't want to just cut it, cut it down. We, you know, we, that's why we ask for the forestry service to create this plan for us so that the, the land is just not, you know, completely um, you know, wiped out. We just, you know, want to take good care of it um, uh, and that sort of thing. Where, where is this map right here that you're showing? Where is this uh, city water lake in regards to it? <coughs> Excuse me. That's the track on Coal Store Road. <coughs> okay, this is Coal yep. Store Road. Yeah, well, that one well. is. And the other one's on Campbell, mm -hmm. Campbell Road. Okay, well, what, are, you, what are your ideas that we need to do on these areas? <coughs> This one right here is the, uh, the property that the watershed is on. And Matt divided it into three areas. Uh, and with each area, we should concentrate a different type of um, you know, yeah. uh, land management. In, in area one, it's, it's approximately 530 acres. Um, now, due to forest practice guidelines, which are laws, uh, it's requiring you know that we cannot disturb the actual watershed and stuff. So. We've advised uh, to leave a, a buffer around the lake, um, but what we recommend is going through and actually removing the hardwood uh, trees that are in there, the turkey oak and blackjack oak. They're non-merchantable, uh, so they're, they're really no non-beneficial for, for timber purposes. But what timber purposes that you do have there is longleaf pine, and it's mature and it's, well, it's growing well, but the thing is, with the with the turkey oak, it's also absorbing the nutrients and everything that from the pine trees to to grow and be healthy trees. So we've recommended that you do a hardwood removal uh, with a whole tree chipping operation. Would go in there and grind. Uh, they would cut the the turkey oak and blackjack and remove it from the stand, chip it up, and send it as a hardwood chips to a mill to be processed for either. OSB boards or fuel chips or any type of uh, material that can be used for, for wood purposes. Also in the whole in the time that they're doing the hardwood removal we ask that they go in and also thin the heavy pockets of pine trees because there's some places in there super thick when the trees are very thick they can't grow well to their full potential and so what we're going to do is actually invite sunlight to hit the floor the forest floor. When that happens um, you're going to have response from grasses, uh, which would also increase your wildlife populations and stuff of that nature. So it's more healthy, more beneficial. By reducing the hardwood, your fire threat's going to go down. Um, in Richmond County, it's not a matter of if, 
it's win. Um, 200 wildfires a year just in Richmond County, highest in the state has been the f past five years. That area right there is prominent for for having wildfires. Um, you know, we can we can smoke one right through there, and next thing you know, all the standing timber that's there could be gone, just like that. Um, so if we reduce the threat by thinning out the forest floor, um, it makes it accessible for fire engines, equipment. We can get in there and stop it. Also, it just it's more healthy for the actual stand itself. Um, once you remove the hardwood, you're going to open it up to a pine, a uh, longleaf pine growing. Pine straw is a hot commodity in the county, also in the whole Sand Hills region. Um, contractors pay big money to have uh, their land, or excuse me, landowners have contractors <coughs> pay them big money to come rake their pine straw, which is a revenue source for, could be for the city. Um, also, the main thing with this management plan is is doing something with the land right now because as it, as it stands right now it's non-productive there's no money being made off of it we want to turn it back into something where it can be beneficial throughout the years of time where you can constantly see a an annual income come off of this property for coastal road and for campbell road um, that's the whole area of area one 530 acres area two is all standing longleaf timber with a few scattered loblolly and slash pine. Um, 177 acres, that's on the south side of this. Um, approximately 50 years old, it's growing well, it's tall, somewhere between 50 to 70 feet tall. And that's, it's in saw timber uh, size right now. So having it thinned out, could automatically, that's revenue straight for the city, straight up. Um, after that's done, you can have it thinned. Um, we can start burning it or raking the pine straw, however you want to do it. But there's annual income to be made on all of this property just by doing simple uh, harvesting operations, um, but not clear cutting. It's just thinning. And so it, laying a light hand on the land, it's still going to look good. Uh, that's for the, the Campbell Road area. Um, that's pretty much on that one. Does anybody have any questions on pertaining to the Campbell Road? Where, where, E.G., where are we currently doing land applications? It's on Coastal Road. It's on Coastal Road, right? okay. It was on the first slide. Yeah. It went by so fast, I kind of yeah. missed okay. it. Mm -hmm. Just right. as E.G. said, this is the property uh, the city owns off of Cold Store Road, um, where the wastewater treatment plant land applies the sludge from the, from the plant. Mm -hmm. And you can barely see the roads or the rows from the map. We, we apply the sludge on these roads um, and the, the, the foliage and the, the trees in between each row is uh, kind of maturing and, and we need that to be uh, cut back a little bit so we can access it better. Back a month or so ago, I believe we had a bad fire out there, didn't we? It's in, it's in area one. Mm -hmm. um, if you zoom out, uh, just about where it says area one on the map, uh, we had 20 acre wildfire there. Um, it's on a Sunday, I think it was. Um, it's just a real hot fire. And matter of fact, the whole 20 acres that that uh, was burned is dead. Uh, stump sprouts are happening now, but that's the threat. Uh, Catastrophic wildfire at the right time comes through, it's all gone. There's nothing we can do about it. Right. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to mitigate that. Uh, area one, 276 acres. Uh, it was previously clear cut, I want to say 10, 15 years ago. Right. I don't know to be exact. Uh, it's just basically grown up in what we call trash. Um, you got a few pines, uh, hardwoods growing up out there. Basically what we've recommended is during this whole operation of uh, the harvesting, we want that whole area of Area 1 to be clear-cut by means of a whole tree chipping and then to be reforested with either longleaf pine or loblolly pine. Um, that, but at the time, that'll be recommended after it's cut. We won't never recommend anything to be done until the track's harvested. That way we know for a fact what would be best for the site, whether the city wants to expand their wastewater uh, treatment stuff if they want to go on out to there but at the time 
right now for area one, we just say the best thing is to, to clear cut what is on the site and um, get it off of there so we can start fresh. So uh, if we get, went back with longleaf pine, um, approximately eight to 10 years from the time of planting, probably more or less like six to eight, but we, we recommend eight to 10. Uh, pine straw could be removed from it, um, raking purposes. Uh, average of what we're seeing with private landowners are getting somewhere between 100 to $150 an acre off of uh, their land. That, that's what the payment's coming to them as uh, from contractors raking the pine straw. So, I mean, there's, there's income uh, possibilities just by having the longleaf and the pine straw. So, um, it's there, why not use it um, mm -hmm. instead of just letting it lay dormant. Uh, so, area two, on the map, approximately 83 acres. Um, stuff's growing like crazy. <laughs> uh, the waste, the waste of water is it's good nutrients. <laughs> um, let's see, we've um, 13 to 15 years old. It's kind of what we we guessed, um, or um, we didn't guess. We we bored the trees, but uh, the rings are so big, <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell. <laughs> so we we're we're thinking close to 13 to 15 uh, average 40 to 45 feet tall um, 6 to 10 inches in diameter so I mean they're they're Help. trees yeah. like that they're growing <laughs> um, it's a direct uh, effect from the wastewater it's a uh, good nutrients going into the trees so it's making them grow mr. Gordon yes how much fat how much faster are the trees growing than say a, a normal tree would, you think? Twice well, as fast? Or? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> two, two to, could be up to three, because that's a sandy site, very sandy. That longleaf pine would have been the the actual tree of choice if if it had been a private landowner that didn't have to plant something in the ground. We would have recommended longleaf, but uh, to see loblolly growing like that in dead sand is is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so, um, yeah. I wish I had that growing on my place. Uh, so because of the um, the truck trying to access it, going in and out, and the rows, the limbs are growing so fast, also they're, they're um, hitting the truck and, and making it difficult for passage, we've recommended this stand being thinned. Um, we don't recommend it being thinned whole tree chip because a whole tree chip in operation brings in a, a lower price, but if you were actually have it long wooded, and actually cut and take to a deck, and they haul it out as pulpwood tree length, you get a higher price. I mean, somewhere between um, I've heard eight to twelve dollars a ton for for pulpwood prices, and chip prices are about fifty to seventy-five cent a ton. So the trees are big enough, and we think that it should be pulpwood size, thin it that way. Um, so, I mean, there's money to be made there. Also, along with benefiting the city from not tearing up their equipment. And um, area three, we got 145 acres. Um, really, we could probably narrow that down and say it was more or less like 120 because uh, the trees growing closer to the creek are bigger because the soil is better there. So that area could probably be thin, but we're, it's just easiest to divide it up by a creek saying this side and that. But um, uh, those trees, approximately nine to ten years old, is what it looks like when we cord those. So, um, I don't know where they planted at the same time. Uh, they were right at it. Yeah. Maybe six months okay. Before, so it's hard for us to tell that one. So those other ones were showing, uh, you know, 15 years old, and these it looks like they're nine. So, and that. Yeah.
Well, if they were playing at the same time, that tells you what soil fertility will do. Um, <laughs> that one's doing good with what's what's being put on it. Um, so basically what we think is just, just let it grow for about another five years before thinning. And if a logger does come in and he feels that some of it he can thin, or you're consulting forester, um, that, would, that would be the best thing to do, uh, is to utilize that, uh, what they recommend as far as what they think they can thin or harvest or anything. Um, but that, that's basically what we've come up with for the uh, city is uh, some, some ways to generate some revenue. Um, any any questions on that? I guess the only question I got for uh, Marcus, uh, what kind of figure we're we looking at if we have to hire a consultant. Um, that's sort of to be determined. We would send out uh, requests for proposals, and certainly the revenue. We we assume that the the revenue that we get will uh, will exceed what this cost would be, and we also assume that a most consultants would probably agree to uh, have their fee uh, based on a percentage of the revenue. Yeah. So the way it typically works in the private sector, um, and I would assume that it would work the same for city because I've heard it happening this way, is a, a private consultant, they work and they look out for the best interest of whoever their client is. Okay. And so it's not necessarily that you have to pay up front or anything like that. They get paid off of uh, percentage so the more money that they make on a timber sale the more money that they'll make goes in their pocket and then normally I hear of anywhere from 8 to 12 percent is what they charge uh, off of the actual timber sales that's what they'll make so the more that they're actually able to to make on a timber sale is the more they're gonna put in their pocket so they're gonna look out for you and they're gonna make sure that they get the best mm -hmm. price possible for the wood so Normally it doesn't actually work as far as you writing someone a check saying, okay, thank you for being our consultant. It's, you know, you pick the best one that you think's fit for the job. Um, and I've provided a list of consulting foresters. It's on the state website um, that actually work in this area. Um, and so they're going to, I, I, well, I gave it to them, so they're going to actually look through it and uh, see who they want uh, to actually do it. But, um, yeah, it's just normally it, they, they set, they set their price and say it's a certain percentage of, of the actual timber sale, and it's not actually a, a, a charging figure. But, I mean, I could be wrong. Some, some people could say, no, I, I want to do it this way, so I'm not wanting to hold anything, you know, to that. But normally it's a percentage. Anyone else got a question for Mr. Gordon? I appreciate, I appreciate you putting that together Thank you for, for all your work. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, Anyone want to make a motion to allow the manager to proceed with this project? I'll so move it. A motion and a second. Any further conversation on it? If not, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Have your, and thank you, Mr. Gordon, for what you've done on that. I know it's a big help to uh, Mr. Dunn on getting his trucks in and out down there. The other property across... 74 bypass, and I'll be providing a plan for that here. Okay. Soon. So just to throw that in there. Yeah. It's not, not a big area, but probably going to be the same thing. Thank you. Okay, moving into old business item number eight, uh, asking for adoption of amendments to the animal control ordinance, which is your enclosure number one. Uh, this item was tabled from the July meeting. And the manager will provide an update, and uh, if possible, we'll try to take action on this and get it out of the way tonight. He's, he'll look, he's putting it on the board. I believe, Mr. Mayor, um, I believe there was a, a typo or two from uh, the previous month, uh, or at least the uh, enclosure from last month. Uh, we, we corrected that. And I was also able to find out some additional information that some of you asked. You asked about uh, its hours of operation and its availability of accepting the animals. Um, they're open to the public from Tuesday through Saturday from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. However, there's someone there at 8 a.m. Uh, all day, every day, pretty much. Um, the shelter does have a drop-off location if it's after hours, say nights or weekends. 
uh, and the shelter cannot turn a dog away if the shelter is full per county ordinance. Um, there's someone always on call in case there was an animal emergency um, and someone needed, their, needed to be there at the shelter for our request, um, even though they're, they're closed on Sunday and Monday. Um, I also met with the police chief and the police captain, and uh, we just further discussed the equipment that we need, uh, and um, uh, which includes, you know, safety equipment and animals to, I mean, equipment to trap the animals, as well as safety gear to keep our, our people safe. Um, we would all, we would also need a, a vehicle eventually. Uh, and, uh, if you have any questions for our police chief, I uh, um, entertain. You speak with him at this I think time. my biggest question was we're kind of got kind of a fuzzy area in there of what we're going to do with animals if we pick up an animal and, that, and the shelter can't take it. That's the thing per the county ordinance. Per, the county ordinance does not allow. They must accept it. Even if the shelter is full, they've got to accept the uh, the shelter. Do they only do they only accept from municipalities when they're full or anyone? I don't know the answer to that question, I, but I would assume just mi municipalities. Mm. Well, no, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can certainly find out. Well, I'm not, I wouldn't waste your time. I'm just just curious. But uh, the county ordinance, uh, according to the shelter director, <coughs> they're required to accept animals even if the shelter is full. I think that was one of the biggest concerns. Chief, what kind of uh, equipment are we looking at? Training are we looking at? The I think the training we kind of talked about last time. Right. I mean, that's um, equipment probably minus truck could probably be around twenty five hundred dollars just to get uh, the box to go on the back of the truck, the gloves, the, the catch poles, um, and, and the, the box um, to go on the truck. Traps, just like one trap, one large yeah. trap, one small trap. Twenty five hundred. How about animal control officer? Is that going to be a police officer doing that job? Or? The way we discussed, sort of do it like Rockham does. Um, Trying to few up. Just, you know, just the officer would go out when they get a call and come get the truck and you know, pick up the trap, the dog's trap. Well, Rockingham's a little bit bigger than Hammond. They got a few more people on the shifts, and I can tell you from experience, it ain't a case of just getting in the truck and run, get a dog, and and back in five minutes. Yes, sir. There's a lot involved in in catching the dog, investigating different things. It's gonna tie an officer up right much of the time. Now, I don't know whether we got enough officers to actually be tied up on a dog situation. We might ought to be looking at maybe hiring a, uh, an animal control officer. It's just a thought. <clears throat> we currently get very few calls. Sometimes we might get one call per month, and then some months we might have eight or ten calls that month. It varies. Um, and in the future, we could certainly look at uh, changing. You know, we we could schedule to have a, a specific. Uh, we could you know create a, a new position, or we could have. Uh, reserve, or it could be overtime pay. You know, we could we could work that out, whatever is in you know in the best interest of the city. Yeah. If the demand increases, they don't always coincide. Right. The, he's he don't have nothing to do, but it would be our luck to have a bank robber while he's out there messing with a dog, and we're short already. Right. You see what I mean? Um, or some other shooting or something. And you got an officer tied up trying to catch it. Uh, I don't know. I think we ought to consider looking into the possibility of hiring that situation. If we got to get into business, we might as well get in it all the way and do it right. And I can tell you, once the citizens realize we got an animal control officer right now to call. Yeah. These other people that can never get a hold of nobody. Mm -hmm. But once they find out we got one, this increase. Call every day. 
<laughs> this increase, I mean, this, the volume will increase here on dog calls. I hear it all the time myself. I mean, you know, people complaining to me about dog calls. This or that, I hear it all the time. You know. I don't know whether they call in here or not. We do. When when they call us, our officers go already. They're all the, our officers on shift are all. They are already are the first to respond. Um, yeah, I know. We take care of all animal calls that have been trapping and transporting. We take. And they enforce the law too. They don't because they got to. But what I'm saying is, wouldn't you like to have a separate animal control officer to handle all that <laughs> rather than a police officer to try to work in between? I would, but that's just food for thought. I know. If, um, if, if the need is there, we can certainly try to budget for that for next year. We can talk about it in next year's budget process. Yeah. Or if, if we needed it before then, we could, you know, we could consider that yeah, too okay. as the demand. Yeah, well, I would just like the officers rises. to know that this is, a, this is probably different. I've been there, done that. I know what I'm talking about. Police officers in general are not dogs. control officers, and they, they don't want to be. I can tell you that. Do it, but you have a lot better transition, of a lot better job if we have an animal control officer that that's his job. And piggybacking off what he said, that may be something to look at, uh, like auxiliary officers. Anything, but um, maybe look at starting an auxiliary program. There's officers out there that are certified, they're not working, that would love to hold their certification, um, let them come in and instead of doing standard police work, let them do stuff like that and may accomplish what Chief Martin said and do it for free or at a very low cost of supplying the uniform and equipment to the officers. Or well, it might be an officer would like to do that part time as a second job. <coughs> when he's off, he's, he's an animal control man. Stuff like that. Yeah. Definitely a good idea. I, I go walking every night and I walk probably two different routes in the past two weeks. And every time I went walking, there was a dog somewhere in different places that was not chained up, was not fenced, that came at me. Um, so the, the complaints are out there. And it's, it's falling on the city to take this over. And we're going to have to do it. And you got to be safe about it. Like the chief said, you don't, I don't want to be catching dogs. Your workers' comp's going to probably go up. Your officers on injuries going to go up. So it does make sense to look at hiring somebody specifically for that bump person or through the auxiliary program. Just work on that and see what you can come up with. And if possible, I'd like to go ahead and get the amendments to the Animal Control Ordinance approved tonight. I have a motion. See any issues with the amendment? I mean, we just got to work out the kink with the who's right. going to do it. So the amendment looks fine, so I'll, I'll uh, move to approve that uh, ordinance there. Okay. Need, a, need a second? Second. Presented. Have a second. Any further discussion on the amendments? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, item nine, we deleted that. that. That has already been taken care of on personnel leave time. The next item to come up will be a public hearing on a clarification to the swimming pool ordinance, uh, chapter 19 of the code. Gentlemen, it would be uh, enclosure number three. And either the city manager or you'd like to enlighten us on this as what was done. Yes, sir, Mayor Bayless. We currently, the city currently has a swimming pool ordinance uh, with stipulations that uh, outline the requirements for uh, owning a <coughs> swimming pool in, inside the city limits. And uh, part of those requirements to the swimming pool ordinance uh, uh, basically require that uh, each swimming pool, uh, if it's um, taller than, I want to say two feet, but I could be wrong what the distance is, but the swimming pools must be um, separated 
from public access. In other words, a barrier must be present um, separating the swimming pool itself uh, from, uh, the, uh, from uh, the street. And um, a citizen um, brought up the question of it, you know, if they, they have an above ground swimming pool that in this pool includes a ladder that can be attached, detached. Um, their question was, can the pool wall itself, if it's an above ground pool, serve as the barrier? And the way that staff has always interpreted it was that even an above ground swimming pool, you could just step off of the street however many feet um, and jump into the pool and, and drown. And then therefore it's a, it's a, a safety concern. So that's how staff has always uh, interpreted it, and we wanted to clarify and make sure that the ordinance itself states that very clearly. Uh, and Ms. Ms. Strickland can go into further detail um, about that, but um, um, Do you have any questions? Is it so? Okay. Go ahead. Are, are we? <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. Going to get the information out. Yeah, get the information out. Yeah. And uh, I don't. Uh, Miss Strickland, could you come up just a minute and let's somebody that understands what's going on here. Are, are we talking about a situation here where people right now have to go back and refence certain swimming pools? Or? Oh, no. Well, every year we have situations to where we have pools that are put up that do not meet this zoning compliance that was adopted, I think, in 2009. And when the ordinance was adopted in 2009, it was the intention at that time of the planning board and council that any swimming pool over 24 inches that had a soft side uh, material would require to have a separate fence, a barrier. Well, pool materials have changed since 2009. And so we have not changed our practice. The only thing this ordinance does is clarifies the type wall to say that a hard resin or an all metal swimming pool wall can serve as the barrier as long as it is 48 inches or higher. But if it is a soft-sided pool, the vinyl, the rubber, the type that will give so that a child can climb up it, then those types do not serve as a barrier and an additional 48-inch barrier, all that remains the same. We're just adding clarification to the type of pool wall that um, requires the barrier. Nothing any different. We, we're not enforcing it any differently. It's just making clarification as far as the type walls. Um, there was one change that the planning board did where we did have a pool, a uh, swimming pool was considered anything 24 inches. And one of the planning board members pointed out that you could have a 36 inch pool, 48 inch pool, but say I only have 24 inches of water in it. Well, how we're going to prove that it only has 24 inches of water in it all the time. So they asked that the definition, as you will see there, be changed to any pool wall over 24 inches. But we are not changing anything. We, this has been the same practice that we have done since the ordinance was adopted in 2009. Every year, I mean, it, it, it's heartbreaking to me. We get a call that, you know, somebody's gone and bought their grandchild or bought one of these small inflatable pools that are 48 inches or three foot or, you know, they bought it for their kids for the summer, um, but it's the soft sided and we have to tell them you either got to put up a fence or you have to take it down. Um, but it's a safety issue. I mean, you know, as, as sad as it is to make somebody take a pool down, it's worse if a child drowns. So we are not changing anything in practice. Um, every year I get calls, I, we don't, this is not something the city goes out looking for. Believe you me, I call them pool police that will call me and say, have you seen the pool at such and such? And we go look, and if it does not meet the ordinance that was adopted in 2009, 
then we have to contact them and tell them they either have to put the fence up that meets the specifications. The specifications for the fence has not changed. They either have to meet the specifications or they have to take it down. A safety issue. So there again. Any Thank other you. questions? Okay. Gail, couldn't we about January, February on the water bills put something on there about the swimming pool ordinance? I mean, they're so I, I don't know what's allowed on the water bill. Um, well, I, I just, I just know it's limited. I know it's limited space. Yeah, I know, I know it it's is, limited but space. But, um, you know, at least it, that way, January, it's February, no fun February, to enforce it. I will tell you that. Well, it is no fun to enforce it. But at the same time, if I get a call and we don't enforce it and a child climbs up that pool and drowns, I'm going to feel worse. So it's a matter of safety. Well, that would be my concern would be the ladder outside the pool or if the pool's up the side of a wall or something that a kid can well, walk the, and fall in or something like that. Well, the like ordinance that. also <laughs> says if, it, if the pool itself serves as the barrier, say you've got a 48-inch pool that's the hard side and it has the steps on the ladder, you either have to have the type that goes up or removable. You have to do that. That's another safety feature but that's not changed that's been in the right, ordinance as long, long. As, the, as long as there's no outside excess to the pool like a ladder or upside a wall or something well is, the understanding is that what the is under, that the, it depends on the what the pool is made out of if it's vinyl rubber soft-sided it does not serve they have to have a separate fence because that is something a child can climb those pool walls give in they will slope in and allow a child to climb up them if it is a hard resin or a metal, then it is the same as a fence. It does not require something You don't different. have to have a fence if it's, no, sir, if not, it's if metal. It's, mm -hmm. If it's 48 inches, it has to be 48 inches, and it has to be hard resin or metal pool walls, then that serves as your fence. Anything else, you're going to have to have a separate fence. I imagine if people knew that, they would... Oh, yes, sir. I have problems with this every year. <laughs> every year. Lots. You go buy a pool for $59.69. This year, somebody had these pools on sale for $2.99. There are some, really some nice-looking swimming pools. And I understand. I mean, I do, that people want to have these for their children. But the ordinance says, and that's what I have to enforce, but yes, sir, several a year, several a year. That lady in the back, yeah. if you would come up to the uh, podium, please, and state your name. Thank you, Gail. Hi. My name is Katie Miller. Um, I live at 628 Oak Avenue. Um, I was one of the people that got called on this year about the pool. Um, what this, um, I'm pretty sure other people have pointed out, like the county man or the city manager had stated, about how it wasn't very clear in there. Um, but what this is requiring, what they're making changes to, basically permanent pools don't have to have a fence around it, but non-permanent pools do. So a pool that's only going to be up for the summer has to have a fence around it. Um, that doesn't make much sense. My pool was a 48-inch vinyl pool. Um, my walls aren't soft. It holds, I think, 4,000 gallons of water. As you can imagine, the water is tight in there, and it makes it hard. Um, if the ladder is removed, locked, I didn't see um, the issue with it. Um, I just don't think that vinyl is soft. I don't think it's maybe what you guys are thinking. Um, and it's on your property. I understand the safety, all that stuff. As long as the ladder is removed and that it's not this type of, it's not soft, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's hard vinyl. You can't climb up it. The only way to get into the pool if the ladder's removed is if you are tall enough to step over a, a four-foot wall. What, how do you put, what happens when you put water in the pool? How does it, do you have to put some structure up it's and still, then put the liner in there, then put water, or you just set it, it on the ground and start filling it no, up No, 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 no. Mine, you have to actually put it together. It has the steel, um, oh metal poles <laughs> that go around the sorry yeah line. that go around you have to actually put it together and then they go into the ground it's a hard vinyl um that you have to insert into the make it circular you know i'm probably not explaining this clear um i actually wasn't the one that are put there it 
Are there slots where the poles slide in that yes, go down and in? The pool, it's it's vinyl, and it's got little pull-out slots where the pole goes through it and then goes to the ground. Um, again, there's... How, how is it mounted in the ground? Is it just set on top of the ground? It sits on the ground. It, I'm pretty sure that's what you're asking. Yeah, it just sits on the ground. It's not on like a cement block or anything. It's just, it was sitting on the ground. Um, to me, and again, the I'm not really sure. I know that they said it's complaint-based system. Um, I don't think that that's fair. You have to have somebody call on you to do it. I feel like if it's going to be enforced, it needs to be enforced throughout, um, not just certain people. Again, I live on Oak Avenue, um, right behind here on Oak Avenue. There's been a pull-up all summer. I'm not going to call on someone because I don't feel like that's fair because I had to take my own pull down. Um, two streets over on Henderson Street, me and my daughter went and were riding bikes uh, yesterday. Two pools I saw over there. Again, I'm not going to call because it's not fair. I don't want to ruin somebody else's summer. But it, it's hard vinyl. There's no way to climb up it. Um, and I don't think it, it's fair. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In listening to what she had to say, I really don't <coughs> see why it would make any difference if it was vinyl or metal on the side. As long as there's not access to the pool with a ladder or, or some type of wall that they could, a kid could walk across and just jump in or something. I don't see the problem myself. Why would it? I know, that's what I'm saying. I don't see why it should make any difference what the wall is, whether it's vinyl or steel. I just don't see the difference as long as there's not some excess to the pool. This just don't make any sense because if it's a pool with steel, it's okay. And a kid could climb a steel pole or jump it or something as well as they could a vinyl. I don't understand. As long as there's not excess to the pool from the outside, I don't see the problem. I yeah, think I think the, the issue should be safety. And just because that ordinance has been there doesn't mean we can't look at it in in the future and, and make safety, make changes that, that could be safe as well, uh, such as removing the ladder from the pool. Any pools that are less than 24 inches, you know, state that they have to be drained uh, after each use. Um, the only situation I can remember a kid getting in a pool uh, here in this town was uh, several years ago. It was an in-ground pool that had a fence and it With was latched. To, he had undid the latch and fell in the pool. Um, I had a complaint the first time I was on council. A uh, lady had brought a, uh, bought a pool that didn't have a pump, didn't have ladders. It was just a, a blow-up pool, and it was about 20, 18, 24 inches, I guess 24 inches. <coughs> Somebody complained. And this was just something they were going to fill up and, and empty out, fill up and empty out. But the reality of it is you're not going to get somebody to go spend fifty, sixty dollars on the pool and then a thousand on the fence. So I, I would like to see us go towards more you know, safety uh, and not so much the fence. Uh, there's a I won't call any locations, but there's an above ground pool that meets the um, criteria for the fence. Um, and they've actually got chicken wire up around it in their front yard. So I think if you can make them safe by removing the ladders or you know, either draining the pool to where there's you know no access on the smaller pools. I think that's something we need to look at. Um, to um, <clears throat> I had a little short spill because I you know after hearing about this we were looking at it. Um, there were some comments and stuff posted on various uh, social media sites. <laughs> um, and first of all, you know I want people to understand that council didn't ride around to find this. This was something found in an ordinance that needed to be looked at because, as Gail mentioned, it was kind of, you couldn't understand it as to what it was supposed to be. So we have a planning and zoning board, which, by the way, are, they probably get paid about as much to get their gas to go to and from the meetings to be a part of that board. So they worked through this, and, and you know, I feel like, you know, to you got to learn the whole thing of it, you know, before kind of posting and, and commenting on stuff. So, so staff found these problems in the ordinance. 
Our planning and zoning board worked through it to figure out what we could do to change it, get it up to date where it made sense and we understood what it meant. But to kind of go along with what Jesse has said, as well as uh, Mr. Martin, is the way I looked at it is, is we talk 24-inch pools, we're talking the wall, not the water. We're talking a wall, a 24-inch wall. If it is a 24-inch wall, whether you have it above ground or below ground, you should have to take that pool down at the end of its use or put a fence around it because you cannot secure that pool. That's just common sense. When you get into a 24-inch or higher pool, so long as you can secure that pool, and this is just my opinion here. This is not a vote. It's not a motion. I'm just what I'm telling you. Because I feel like we're trying to do some kind of homeowners association. We're trying to get government involvement in how you do your yards and your pools, and that's not our job. Uh, it is to impose safety, which this is what we're talking. So 24 inch or less, in ground or not in ground, you've got to deflate it, take it down, drain it after use every day. 24 inches or above, you, you need to have some way to secure it. No part of that pool can be in the ground, so you can't think you're going to get 24 inches or higher and then try to dig you a hole and make you an in-ground pool. That's not the way it's going to work. It, it should be that it has to be secured. Ladder removed or ladder put in and locked. Okay? Anything other than that, if it's in the ground, period, period, if you have a quarter of it in the ground, if you have a piece of it, all of it, whatever, you should have a fence in your yard. And that's just the way I see it, and that's my opinion. I think that's kind of what you were saying. Um, and I think that's kind of what you said, and I feel like that's a little bit about what you were saying because I'm like you. You got 4,000 gallons of water on a wall, you know, and, to, and, and a, the, the biggest point brought to me in this whole situation is if we're going to make homeowners put a fence around their pool, we need to look at putting one around the city lake. I mean... Ma'am, you'll need to come back up to the mic. Thank you. I had it up all year last year. I didn't realize, um, honestly, that there was any kind of ordinance. Um, we moved from the beach, so we always had a pool to go to. We never had to have one in our backyard. Um, I had it up all year last year. It was never an issue, and we just came across it this year. It's something that gets, it got taken up all last winter. It's not up all year round. Of course, we, you know, we drain it, put it up. The permanent pools, like I said, don't require a fence. So that's why I was just kind of iffy about it. And, it, you know, we, are, you, you have to, we have to look after kids' safety. I understand. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the number one thing is, you know, we don't want it resting on us. Mm -hmm. However, if it's in your yard, it's going to rest on your homeowners association mm -hmm. or your, your homeowners insurance. So it's going to come on you. Um, but, you know, to, we have a lot of fish to fry in this city. And riding around and finding out who's got their pools fenced in is not one of them. Um, however, I do believe with a 24-inch pool, and I, and I spoke to our attorney about this to find out his thoughts, a 24-inch pool wall, period, if it's 24 inches, you've got to take it down. Um, yeah, you get finished with it, has, you know, not we'll, we'll get it in the morning, and it's got to be taken down then. You mean take it, take it down each time you finish it? A 24-inch. Put it back up the next day and yeah, all that? Yeah, a 24-inch. Because that's you can't secure that kind of pool. 24-inch, I'm not talking about. Huh? That's what I say, you can't secure it. And, the, and that's, that's the... Herbert, come up the microphone there if you would. Come up the microphone and so we can hear you. You, come on. <laughs> You want to know about what type of fence? Yeah, what's the type of fence I'm talking about? It can be any type of fence. Like uh, somebody uh, said, they seen said one that had chicken wire chicken. around oh, it, I believe. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a... Specific. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. There are specific, I mean, there are specific fence, requirements, <laughs> but it says that it has to be no more than a two-inch gap from the ground to the bottom of the fence that the individual holes cannot be more than four inches, mm -hmm. that it has to be 48 inches high, that you have to have a self-latching gate. All that is included in there, the specifications for the barrier. So, Now, as you said, is, are there metal that's up that looks like the chicken wire that has that, but it doesn't meet more than four inches. Wow. It does meet the requirement. But additionally, 
Additionally, to put the fence up, they've got to come get a fence permit, right? Yes, sir. And that now, and if council's going to, I mean, I, I'm, I will I enforce what council yeah. gives me to enforce, but I need some clarification from you because are they going to be still required to get a pool ordinance from us, a, a zoning compliance from us for the pool if we say that they're not going to have to have the fences? I mean, are we going to allow, as in um, the situation here, the pool was in the front yard. Our ordinance says you cannot have a pool in the front yard. Are we going to change that? No, yeah. That okay. Yeah, that we do need to. What if they ain't got room in the backyard? Yeah, because I we'll talk to them. We can't start talking about <laughs> that. Just becomes a new. Okay, spot. but there's a lot. There's a lot though clarification I'm going to need from you. Okay, so yeah, you just tell me what to enforce, and I'll certainly do it. Okay. come in compliance with the fact. You are. I'm going to measure it tomorrow. <laughs> I've had an in-ground pool for 50 years. And the only way to have it perfectly safe is don't have it. The most dangerous thing about a pool is a diving board. The 13-year-old girl dived off mine some years ago, hit right on the chin. I could just see me buying a teenager mouthful of teeth. She didn't get hurt, thank goodness. I immediately took the board down, took it out behind the barn and burned it. And then when the young lady run in it that Saturday night and destroyed it. Uh, the fella insisted that I wanted a diving board. I said, mm-hmm. And then one time, I believe Calvin destroyed the pool out there, using it as a hydrant. I love him use it. <laughs> at that time, the uh, furniture plant paid for it to put back. Said it saved them $200,000 worth of building. Now, when the young lady run in it, no insurance, no driver's license, no license tags, no job. Uh, My insurance paid most of it. But the only way to have a safe pool is don't have it. That's right. You got that right. Thank you, Herb. The, uh, the only thing I'd like to say is Eddie made a good point. I mean, Jonathan was saying whether well, disagree or agree, take it down to two-foot pools, take them down every night. Then we're going to have to have a pool police for sure, <laughs> along with our animal control well, officer. You're going to do it with Maybe that would be another job yep. for her yep. or him you're, or her. Or whoever whether you put a be. fence up or you don't, whether you have a pool or you don't, you're going to yeah. have, you just got to police it regardless. Because what's going to happen is the child's going to get drowned in it, and then they didn't take the water out of it or something like that, and we don't want that to happen. Um, it's yeah, it's a this, bad situation. It's way. a fight no matter which way you go. Yep. Okay, we're, we're still in a public hearing. If there's anyone else that has any comments on this, please come up. We certainly would like to hear from you. If not, we'll uh, close. Uh, be closing. There, wa there was in there, we just spoke about pools being in the front yard. Like that's, that's, that's in the ordinance still, right? No in the front yard. Yeah, okay. Anybody got anything you want to say about that? Okay, well, at this time we're closing the uh, public hearing. <coughs> Uh, the next item is item number 11, which is adoption of the amendment to the swimming pool ordinance. And what are your wishes on it, gentlemen? Uh, I, I think the the amendment they've presented is different than what we kind of have sit here and agreed on. Yeah, I mean, personally, I would like to see us just uh, maybe table this. Table um, it to change the... Uh, so we can look at maybe other ways of making uh, adjustments to the ordinance to where we can maybe include some of the things that Councilman Bowie brought up, some things that Chief Martin brought up myself, yeah, and, and have an, oppor yeah, and have an okay. opportunity to yeah. talk to uh, the attorney about it to make yeah. sure that we do everything legal. We do everything within the, yeah. the, the legal aspect of I'm it. I'm not ready to vote on it. All right. Do I have a motion to table? Yeah, I'm yeah. motion to table. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And if I could, I would just add that, you know, of course, Gil, just follow what you've been following for now until we have a chance to look at it and move forward and, and work with the uh, planning and zoning board. They do a wonderful job. And maybe we can come to some um, agreements that maybe we can have, you know, have these pools with the ladders to be removed and locked up and things like that and, and just change the, the verbiage in the uh, ordinance a little bit to maybe help some of the homeowners in the situation like you were in. Yeah, when do you all meet again? Planning is on <clears throat> Monday. Monday. <laughs>
can also, we, just, can we just try to kind of get some kind of ideas or something? Not now, but just try to figure out some kind of consensus that we can maybe re you know, just present to them to let them look at it again. Or revised draft with the input from council yes. members yeah. for the zoning board. Yeah, and just okay. let them kind of look at it. And think it over. You got I think it would be a good idea to look at what other cities do. Get some ideas what they're doing. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. And item number 12, I'll also need a motion to table that, uh, the uh, consistency statement. Yeah, table that, <coughs> so move. Got a motion? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. All right. <coughs> Next item of business is item number 13. Item number 13 is a discussion of the body cam policy. You should have a copy of that in front of you. Closure number six. And I believe we have a copy on the wall also. And uh, city manager have comments on this. Staff has developed a body cam policy to uh, define how the uh, the body cameras will be used. Um, I have no issues with the draft developed by the staff in our police department. And um, at this time, I invite our police chief to comment or take questions as well as collect input from you all. Is this policy based on other people's policy? Is you, <coughs> that yes, where it came from? Or? Several taken. Um, okay. The national police was used um, in, in Kapow and sat down during a meeting with the staff. On a PowerPoint presentation, we went through and, and hashed through it and made recommendations as a, as a administrative team, and then re, resubmitted it. Okay, council, y'all have questions on the policy at all? I don't have any questions so much. I know that Chief Waters has uh, done. policies in other cities and probably just rocking the I think he's the kind of uh, ordinance that is worthy of, of being passed or adopted uh, uh, without any further conversation on my part. I would recommend I make a motion that we accept the cam uh, the body cam po uh, camera policy that the chief has uh, brought forth. I second that. I have a motion and I have a second. Is there any other discussion? Yeah, I, I agree with what he says. The only thing I would love to see, um, uh, and, and I may have missed it, <laughs> anything involving any use of those cameras from the officers that they not use it as far as posting anything on social media, uh, yeah. email, and anything like it's that. In there. Is, is that it's in there? What, in what there. section is that in? Prohibited use equipment item four. Use it on official business. I just know now there's a lot of things that go on social media. I, did, I didn't see that exact. No, I read it in there. <clears throat> Under uh, Section 5, I think prohibited use of equipment. It addresses cameras should not be used to mm -hmm. record communication with other police personnel. They should not be used to... <coughs> encounters with undercover officers and informants um, should not be used to record when officers are on the break otherwise engage in personal activities um, should not be recorded in any area where individuals have reasonable expectation of privacy such as restrooms locker rooms break rooms um, when recording in a hospital or other medical facilities officers shall, shall be careful to avoid recordings I'm talking about. I'm not talking about actual what Post you're okay. what you're going to record. I'm talking about if they record something. Okay. Next to last. Uh, next to last uh, paragraph under section four. It says officers shall not edit, alter, erase, duplicate, share, or otherwise distribute in any manner. Okay. And it's in and, four. Uh, without prior approval of the chief or his designate. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know I'd read it. I go back and find. No, I read it. So just, <laughs> okay. We've got uh, we've got a motion and a second. And uh, all in favor say aye. 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 
Opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Yes, Y'all did a good job on that policy. <clears throat> okay, item number 14, uh, which is uh, closure number 7, is release of uh, taxes. This, these are done, of course, on, by the county. See any issues with them? Some of the proof. I got a motion, second from Councilman Clewis. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay. At this time, I have a uh, mayoral proclamation. It's the uh, Chiari Malformation Awareness Month, September of 2015. Whereas Chiari malformation is a serious and chronic neurological disorder where the cerebellum descends out of the skull, thereby compressing the brain stem and or spinal cord. And whereas symptoms usually appear during adolescence or early adulthood and can include severe head and neck pain, vertigo, muscle weakness, balance problems, blurred or double vision, difficulty swallowing, and sleep apnea. And whereas there are whereas there are no known preventive measures or cures. Due to the lack of awareness and research of the disorder, persons and family can be under tremendous physical, mental, emotional, and economic strain. And whereas raising awareness of this traumatic disorder is essential to generating federal and private funding for research and a cure, I now therefore I, William Bayless, Mayor of the City of Hamlet, proclaim the month of September 2015 as the Chiari Malformation Awareness Month in the city of Hamlet, and I urge all citizens to take part in activities and observances designed to increase awareness and understanding of the Chiari Malformation. Witness my hand and seal of the city of Hamlet this the 11th day of August, 2015. Item number 16. Is your attachment no, enclosure number nine? There are two openings for the uh, Hamlet uh, Depot board, and we also at this time have two uh, uh, applications for that for those positions. What are your wishes at this time? Two openings and two applicants. Yes, we'll make a motion that we accept these. I have a motion on the floor to accept these two applicants. Second. I have a second. Are there any further uh, remarks? I, I noticed that one of them is, is well qualified. Yeah. And uh, I was. Uh, it's really nice that she took the opportunity to apply for it. We got some background. A lot of experience. Yeah, a lot of mm -hmm. experience, and uh, we're glad to have her. there. these two people will be uh, Mrs. Amber Covington, and. Uh, Mrs. Christy Rose Bean. Kirsten. Kirsten. Okay. Sorry about that. I have a motion and a second. I need a all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Let's have it. Okay. At this time, uh, we'll go into departmental reports. <coughs> Police chief, you have anything for us tonight? Um, I would like. Guys, consider a take home car program for our police department. I think uh, it would be a good morale. Uh, looking at some of the budget meetings in the past, I think it was April 2014, it was a five mile radius given uh, for certain members of our department to, to be able to drive a car home. I think that would be a, something different. Um, we've got 18 cars in our fleet at the moment, and with the more new one coming, it'd be 19 with the pros positions. We have 19 officers. So I think we're we're okay, and uh, some of them won't be driving home because some of them lives out of county, um, some live in county, but be, they will be out of the five mile radius. Um, I think it's also a deterrent for crime, and a positive to see a, a nice shiny house police car sitting in the community. Uh, the guys tend to keep them cleaner and take more pride in the vehicle and take care of it better if they know they got it. And when a, if they're called an emergency, all they got to do is put a uniform on and get in the car and come 
versus coming to the department trying to find a set of keys, get in the car, and, and, and go. They're ready to go from where they live. Chief, what are you talking about? In, um, are you still talking about within that five mile radius? Five mile, I, I guess I just went off of the budget meeting that you guys had. Um, yeah, I remember. What's the fathers you have? Sir? What's the father's person you have? The fathers I have living in the county at the moment is part of it. Um, just in county is part of it, I got. Don't rock an ammo. Uh, had, don't they do that in that their policy to let some officers drive the car? Some officers carry cars home, but I don't think they all do. Um, no, they all don't. They all don't, but some of them do. I think I, I think the five mile radius and inside the county is probably pretty good. I I don't know that I particularly want to have that car sitting in Cordova. Right. Uh, that's what we, the manager and I talked about the five yeah. mile radius. But you're good with that. From Google Map of uh, yeah. City Hall. The best we can tell. Um, the, the state line and the county line is further than five miles away, uh, so it would be outside of that five-mile radius at every point where uh, the state line and the county line is. Um, the closest point would be the state line to the south of us. But uh, you know what the chief and I discussed was um, uh, possibly um, developing a policy that uh, allowed uh, the entire department that lives within. Uh, that five mile radius instead of just the detectives, the chief and the captain, uh, to uh, be issued a take home car. Um. <clears throat> How many people? Three? We got three people right now with take homes? Take homes we have. Or four. One, two, three, six, I think. And do you know roughly how many would be taking them home in addition? If we change that, <laughs> can't be too many. Yeah, it's not too many. <laughs> Probably talking about three or four of that. Why don't you um? Why don't you see how many it would be? Work with Marcus. With what you got now, how you know how many would be involved in that? Um, put together some costs associated with that, fuel costs, extra miles, wear and tear, and and come back with a proposal for us. To look at in the next month or so. Okay. We know the we cars would be better taken care of. Yeah. Assigned yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. I mean, it's definitely yeah. the cars in the community. It's a deterrent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it looks better than sitting in the parking lot over there. Yeah. Um, I Just, personally like it. I would like to know how many. The how many? I, I don't think it would be much more. We're probably talking about a total of ten once you did them all together. That's probably one. Yeah. I would think. Um, I'll, I'll get the numbers though. Because yeah. we did propose the five miles, but I think at the time we just kind of <coughs> said. There's a certain number that's the of people who could do it to take. Yeah, we had people taking cars to Lawrenburg, and that's yeah. what we started yeah, yeah. this with. Right. So yeah. That's what that's brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. Just I understand that. come up with something for us <laughs> next month or so. A little morale factor. In that yeah, too. yeah, is. yeah, morale factor, and and that's you know we're we're aiming at trying to keep our people here, and that's another way of doing it. So. That's right. My discussions with you uh, regarding our leave time uh, uh, updates that we uh, have been working on. He sort of said in passing in, in his uh, experience as a personnel director, uh, one of the um, most inexpensive uh, perks that you can give is a take-home car program to your officers, and it also puts that car in a driveway somewhere in your community, right. mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of making a further police pre presence, uh, community-oriented pr policing, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, we, we will certainly look into those costs to, and try to estimate what that might cost the best we can, and uh, try to get you some pros and cons. Um, to see if that you know might outweigh, if, if you know, if this might help reduce uh, our turnover within the police department. So. Thank you. Uh, Anything else? Mm -hmm. no, okay. Archie. Um, the new fire truck is about six weeks out. It appears to be it's coming along quite well, um, and our. The GI truck is being painted as we speak, basically. So we should have them both back within the next two months. Very yeah. good. Are y'all going to go pick that truck up or are they going to deliver it? Right. We're going to go get it. Nope. And that's in Georgia. Georgia. There, is. <coughs> um, there is a fun day tomorrow up mm -hmm. on Main Street. Around, I think it's around 10 o'clock from 10 to 2. So that'll be a pretty big deal for the kids and all. 
are out on Main Street? Library. At right the library? library. Yes. Oh, okay. Anything else, Chief? Will be there. The what? The big soaker we had. It yeah. It'll be there so, for the kids. Uh, Billy, you've got anything for us tonight? Okay. Uh, Zach? Uh -huh. Mr. Dunn? Okay. Mr. Brown? Okay. Gail, we've already picked on you. <laughs> anything else tonight? Okay. I have a question for Gail. Okay. <laughs> Where are we at on the mobile home park on Boyd Lake Road? I've had complaint after complaint after complaint. Um, it is coming along, I would say, fairly well. Um, is I know he in the fine? Are we finding him? Or no, sir, he's, because, no, okay. no, 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 because we... Um, uh, contacted him, sent the letters, he gave us a plan, he started working. As long as there is significant progress, we will allow him to continue to work. Uh, I do know that they pulled four out last week. One of our department heads actually is the one that has kept me abreast of uh, the progress that's been going on there. Um, I did get a complaint about a lot of fiberglass and all that was out on Side Street, and I don't remember the name of the street, sorry. But I went, um, called the property owner. Um, he did go down over the weekend and get all that in one pile. Um, but I've been in contact with him. Um, like I say, they're doing progress. Um, I see it coming to an end soon. The property owner is aware that once everything is, um, the mobile homes that are being sold or disassembled, what's left, he's going to be responsible for cleaning up the debris that's left. Um, so that's where we are on that. Um, the house that sits there in the middle, I'm working with uh, the attorney where we, uh, um, it's a matter of uh, finding the owners, the heirs. We have sent out certified letters to um, potential heirs. We do know of one that we have an address on where the other two we're uncertain of, but we are working on it, but it does take time. Well, that's what I told them, but they wanted to charge them $100 a day. And I we said, can, as long as, as, long as I know. I said, as long as they're making progress and they've come up with an action plan, and mm -hmm. it is slow, but at least they but are making is, progress. I actually rode through it, something I would not have done two months ago by myself. <laughs> yeah, I noticed it was looking better. It's just not progressing as fast as some people right. think it should. Well, yeah. I, I just, I told them I would check on it. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Gail. What? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry. The Monroe Apartments, didn't we discuss those one time and say that they're paying their fines? No. No. We're not getting fines. No, they're being fined. And, in fact, I just had a reinspection done on those uh, because back, and I don't remember the year. I'm sorry. I don't have that file in front of me. But when the original inspection was done, it was on one building, and we started fining. And um, because of the deterioration in the second one, um, July 1st, when I was allowed to have some more inspections done, mm -hmm. um, I had those inspected. Um, I am in the process of uh, waiting for a letter from our Richmond County building inspector. And once I get that, we are going to uh, hopefully move forward um, with that, but until I, I'm, I'm waiting on that letter, uh, Gary's been on vacation, but I spoke with him last week as a follow-up, and he told me I would have the letters this week from him. So they've been inspected not only by our inspector, but Gary's going to inspect as well, and then hopefully we will be able to move forward with those. Okay. Yeah, you because know, that spot there is very similar to the Kingpin spot that was down there. It's like that's the first thing you see when you come in oh, I agree. on 177. Mm -hmm. Right, I agree. So that's why we have moved forward with that. Uh, Marcus and I went out a couple weeks back and rode around looking at some of the areas, some of the houses that we have that are getting fines, trying to come up with a game plan for what would be our next properties to remove. Uh, be, but because of deterioration of those buildings, we moved them up to the top of the list. And uh, depending on what we can do, we might be able to use the fire department. I had spoken with David Knight some time back about that. Depending on what we're able to do there, we um, want to go that route first. 
and then if we have funding left, of course, then we're going to focus on some houses. But um, that is our number one project right now. Kevin, would you talking about a burn? Yes, but Kevin, I spoke with David a while back, and burn he burn with the gas station. Right? That wouldn't have been David felt like they could get. Far enough away. Yeah. I mean, I know you have some gas to use, but I was just making sure we're going to blow up the gas yeah. station. No. My understanding <laughs> is permits are hard to get now, but because of it being two story structures, that um, David felt like, and this has been a year or so ago that we discussed it, but he could possibly get the permits to burn because of the training exercise that would be involved with those buildings. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Oh. I noticed the one out on 74 right at the city limit. It's gone. Oh, yes. Well, you had to know it was there to realize it was there. <laughs> but, yes, it is. And also um, another property that uh, was right at the fine stage up on Seaboard Street. Uh, I don't know that it's gone, but I know they have started the process with it. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Jill, do you have anything for us tonight? Okay, thank you for being here. Tammy, do you have anything? And City Hall will be closed on September the 7th for Labor Day. Is that correct? Am I have a correct date? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Morphis, do you have anything tonight? Okay. Mr. Abernathy? Mr. Bayless, as uh, Assistant Chief White was uh, stating earlier, um, the Sand Hills Regional Library System will be hosting a, a fun day activities. Um, between 10 a.m. and noon tomorrow, August 12th. I want to invite everyone interested to come out and bring the kids. Um, the city does plan to close Main Street during that time, and traffic will be rerouted around the festival through Henderson, Henderson Jefferson, and Rice Streets. Um, last year's event attracted several hundred people, and uh, the event includes food and refreshment from vendors, space painting, inflatable slides, and the Super Soaker sprinkler system from the 4th of July celebration. So I just wanted to make the announcement that uh, Main Street will be closed during that time for that event. Also, the city has taken on, the city has taken on an intern. Taylor Smith of Rockingham reached out to us with the interest in interning with the city. He is a graduate of Richmond Senior High School and Richmond Community College and just finished up at UNCG. He will be briefly shadowing all the city departments and then he uh, plans to maybe move on to graduate school. So uh, he is here tonight and I just wanted to recognize him. This is a good program and I hope we continue with that as we can get interns. Whatever. That's all I have to report at this time. Thank okay. you. Just uh -huh. for clarification, uh, the city manager is talking about closing Main Street. He's only talking about a block of Main Street, not the whole Main Street now. Just yes, sir. Just one block from Rice Street to Henderson. Yes, sir. That is correct. Thank you. I'm going to deviate just a little bit and ask if our scouts have any questions of either Myself, the city council, or any of the other employees that we have here tonight. Is there anything you need any clarification on? No questions? You got all the answers. Okay. We're sir again we're glad to have you all with us tonight and hope you'll come back and see how city business is run. Uh, at this time I'll ask for comments from the council and I'll start with Mr. McQueen. Um I think I've seen crews out replacing the street lights is that the uh yes the new bulbs is going to say led the uh was it fourteen thousand dollars or something like that yes sir okay good to see that um i'm going to piggyback off what the mayor said and probably had 
great risk of bodily harm to myself. I'm going to introduce the scouts that are here tonight. Uh, I'm not going to make you stand up, but I do want you to either stand up or raise. Okay, I'm going to make you stand up. I'll bring them up um, front. What, what I want to just say real quick, and um, I had the privilege of spending a week with these boys at uh, scout camp um, in the mountains with uh, Mitchell Watson, he's here as well, and uh, Scoutmaster Chris Maples. Um, and during this time, we went over several merit badges, and one of the merit badges was citizenship in the community. I just want to tell you just briefly just a few things what this uh, badge requires these boys. They had to talk about what it is to be a good citizen. They had to look at maps of the county and the city and be able to tell where different places were, city hall, police department, fire department, things of that nature. Historical or other interesting points, which ironically we had you here tonight to tell us about the tourism stuff going on. One of the main things they got to do was attend a city council meeting and look at an uh, a issue and, and talk about it at a future time and give their opinion on what that issue was. Um, then they have to uh, also watch a movie about somebody that's helped the community or a, gr a group of people that's helped the community, as well as they're going to have to pick a charitable organization, and they're going to have to volunteer with that organization for eight hours. And I think we may have something there as well. Um, we'll get you hooked up before we leave. Um, but I, I had a really good time with those kids this past week, and uh, the reason I say it, great bodily harm to myself. One of them is my kid and he hates me doing this. But um, If you would just stand up when I call your name. Brooks, Jonathan, uh, Nick, Kendall, and Caleb. Um, I appreciate y'all coming and we'll discuss some of the things that we talked about here later. Thank you. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clues? I'd just like to say I welcome the Boy Scouts. I was one once upon a time. It's been many years ago. <laughs> but it is good to have them with us tonight. I'd like to thank all our department heads and uh, city employees for all that they do. I know it's going to be a good day. We're, we're uh, hoping for good weather, hot weather tomorrow. So, uh, I think that's all I have. Okay, I've had... Okay. I've had a request from council. If scouts would come up here, please, and stand and let Melanie get a picture of you up here in front of the. Come on. Come on up. Don't be shy, Brooks. Make you turn come, on up. come on up here. <laughs> there you go. Tall one's at the back, short one's at the front. <laughs> Did you have anything else? Okay. All right. Mr. Martin. Well, I really don't have anything to say other than I'm glad to see that the Boy Scouts are still are still alive and doing well. Sixty <laughs> years ago I was a Boy Scout. But my advice to each one of you is this. Do your best to attain the Eagle Scout Award. That will be very, very important to you down the road. Try to, try to get that. That's the most important thing is to try to get the Eagle Scout Award. I didn't make it, but I wish I had. So I'm just telling you all, in, you know, looking back, I can see where it's, it would have been beneficial could have been. My brother was an Eagle Scout, but I, I dropped out by the wayside when I was about, I think I got life, and that's about as far as I got. But glad to see you boys and, and, and being in the Boy Scouts. I don't have anything else. Okay. Mr. Bowie? I don't really have a whole lot. Uh, I am glad to see the Boy Scouts here. and uh, It looks like Ms. Pruitt there is excited to see y'all come see her as well and help out on your volunteer time. So thank y'all for coming. And uh, Brooks, I told you I was going to get you up here, and I did. So I'll call you out again <laughs> if I don't ever do it enough. But, uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've had a really good meeting tonight. Uh, 
we hit on a bunch of things and got a lot of things solved, and, and I hope we can continue to do that and move the city forward and, uh, and work with the county and everything to, to do things that's going to make this place grow. So, uh, Mayor, with that, that's, that's all I have, sir. Okay. I'd just like to say thank you to everybody that's here tonight. It's always nice to see a room full of people and to see as many people interested in what's going on in the city government as you are. So you're always welcome. We're always glad to have you. If you have comments, certainly we're glad to hear your comments. I want to thank city uh, employees, which we like to do every month because they just do a bang-up job with everything that, uh, everything that they do. Police, fire, streets. Uh, I'd ask uh, Billy right now, uh, we're getting in pine straw season again. Watch those drains. I get complaints about stopped up drains. But uh, I think things are growing real well, real well. The trash is being picked up. They're not getting any complaints. Do need to understand that there's certain items that don't get picked up every week. And that's because we just can't get around to do it every week on some of the bigger items. And there's certain trucks that have to pick up. So they come by and get limbs and they leave a, leave a bunch of other junk out there. That's because there's a different thing. The tree limbs go one place and the other junk goes somewhere else. So please bear with us, and they are, they are doing the best they can and with a good attitude, so we appreciate that. Again, remember that uh, September the 7th, which is Labor Day, City Hall will be closed. And uh, tomorrow we'd like to see as many children as we can for the fun day up at the library, and everybody's welcome to come out. Um, when you talked about limbs, um, to, go, to go along with the, the limbs and all, you know, they're supposed to be placed on your property line, not on the curb and in the street. And it's really, I mean, it's about it. It should be on your property so that uh, you don't have cars coming by and you're kind of dealing with having to pay to get someone's car fixed. But also, to these guys that pick this stuff up, if, if it's in the road, you're putting them further out in the road, putting them in danger to pick limbs up. So, you know, please make sure that, that everything's put on your side of the, you know, the curbing so that these guys can get as close as possible and pick this stuff up without endangering themselves out in the middle of the road because I think I saw a couple of the trucks over the past couple of weeks they they're kind of they're almost in the other lane so you know you it just it's a lot of danger involved there so if we can get some help with that and just remember that a lot of people don't know it but you know that kind of is in one of the ordinances about where to put your uh, your uh, tree limbs and trash so just keep that in mind and if you, put the, if you put the pine straw and the yard waste in the street and it rains, it washes it right straight to the drain. And there we are trying to get the drain cleared out. And also another issue that I see a lot of is you need to remember to move your trash cans after the trash people pick your trash up. There's been a lot of trash cans sitting out next to the curb and it doesn't really look good. We do require that they be moved once the trash has been picked up. But we thank you for that. At this time... Uh, we need a motion to go into the closed session. Per North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3, this is for a current uh, client and attorney privilege to discuss uh, the each lawsuit and a couple other updates. So moved. So in the closed session. Got a motion? Second. I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And anybody that would like to stay in here and wait, you're welcome to. We've uh, returned from closed session, getting updates from our attorney. And uh, there was no uh, decisions of any type that had to be made to require a vote. And I would ask at this time if there's no further business for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. A motion and a second. Did we and come back in? Yes. We did. Okay. And, uh, okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay.